Hey, hello, everybody. Um, welcome. Thrilled to have you here. My name is Ilan Stavans. Thank you. Uh, it is a pleasure to be um, in the last of five really extraordinary uh, conversations that we've had throughout the semester. This is the Point Counterpoint series, and uh, we started with uh, George Will. Uh, then we went to Saskia Sassen, we've had Joseph Stiglitz, uh, Amartya Sen, and it's an honor and a thrill to have uh, Martha Nussbaum. I'll introduce her in a second. I uh, want to give you some, pers some uh, parameters of what, uh, of what this is and where we're all going together for the next maybe uh, hour and a half. Uh, the Point Counterpoint series started uh, a year ago uh, as a response to the feeling that many of us had in college campuses like Amherst of uh, being uh, isolated and disengaged with what uh, the country was going through. This was the 2016 presidential election and uh, these liberal bastions, the, the liberal arts colleges and uh, uh, universities uh, were moving at a certain rhythm that was uh, ended up being very different to the rhythm of, uh, of the rest of the country. And it came to many of us as a shock uh, what uh, the results of that election. And uh, more than that, the shock was how uh, fragmented, how polarized, the country was, and as it turns out, not only the country, but the world at large, we were beginning to see the rise of a, a populist, nationalist wave that has colored the last uh, two uh, years, and that has been a sobering lesson for uh, many of us. The question thus, then and now, uh, was and is, uh, how do we listen to those that think differently? How do we humanize those that have a political, ideological views that are unlike ours? How do we manage to remain a family within a larger community where uh, we can accept those that are unlike us? Uh, how do we become a pluralists at a time when relativism, uh, where nationalism is pushing us to the edge. So the idea was to bring uh, different thinkers uh, to campus that would uh, present different ideological views and uh, not cut them, but allow them to speak openly and fluently and express and explain their ideas. And that's what we've been doing and it's been really a thrill. Uh, this, is, uh, this has been an opportunity to understand that those that uh, really uh, think differently are so like us that uh, it, is, it has been a, a self-educating experience. We have a, we're going to have a conversation, uh, Martha and I, for about maybe 40 minutes. I will ask her questions about her most recent book, The Monarchy of Fear, A Philosopher Looks at Our Political Crisis. Um, this is uh, an event that has been sponsored by the class of 1970, more concretely by a number of donors of the 50th reunion of the class of 1970, and I want to be, and I want to thank them for this opportunity. This is connected with a course that uh, we've been having where the students and some visitors discuss these books and uh, have the presence of the speakers and then the larger community, the faculty, the students, the administration, and the larger community here in the Valley has an opportunity to engage the speakers as well. ...of monarchy too, and I think you see that in the present moment where fear is leading people to you know, to yell and say those, that infestation, that caravan, and they want to make those people stay away as though that will comfort them because they can make those other people do what they want because those people are so powerless. And so to act out against the powerless is always a reflex 
of fear. I'm afraid. Oh. It is sponsored by a NEPR's a podcast in contrast as well. And I should tell you that just before today's event right now, Martha and I were in a podcast conversation at NEPR. And so sometimes you might hear something that she and I talked about in that conversation, and I'll make sure to contextualize it and to explain what it was so that it goes further and it doesn't seem as if this is a dialogue only between the two of us. Uh, I want to thank the people of communications, um, Marcus here who's taping this, and the people from marketing and publicity, Austin and Davis, and I want to thank also the folks of uh, Amherst Books. There's going to be a book signing at the end, uh, Martha has graciously uh, accepted to uh, move to the foyer where she will sign books. So I will ask everybody to just uh, be patient so that she can make her way and, uh, and sign books over there. After this uh, 40 minutes or so, we are going to open it up to uh, questions. There is a microphone to my left. Uh, where I ask anybody who is interested in, in, uh, in posing a question or furthering the conversation to please stand and uh, take uh, your turn. Um, I, I am thrilled to have Martha Nussbaum. I have been a reader of hers for quite some time. She's been a compass for me uh, in terms of returning particularly to the classics, um, Cicero and Socrates and Lucian. Uh, and uh, I have also been a, a, a consistent reader of many of her philosophical works. She is a, a very distinguished uh, philosopher who teaches at the University of Chicago. She is at, uh, the in the philosophy department as well as in the law school. And she has been the recipient of many, many awards. Uh, most recently, you pronounce it for me, please. Bergruen, Bergruen Prize, which is the, sure <laughs> it's a it's a one million dollar prize for the for a contribution to in philosophy to the to the perception and understanding of our culture, and uh, we are thrilled to have her here. She has she's the author of many uh, influential books. Uh, she deals with the. Uh, Greek and uh, Roman thinkers. We're going to be talking about that. Uh, she has an extraordinary book about aging. And in this particular book, she deals with the aftermath of the, of the election. And that's, uh, Martha, where I would like to start, if I can. Um, but actually, before I go to, to that topic, I would like to ask you if you could, uh, if you could define for me what a good life is. Uh, well, you know, I'm not going to answer that because I don't think that it, a person who does political philosophy should impose on everyone a single vision of the good life. I agree w wholeheartedly with John Rawls in his second book, Political Liberalism, that political principles should be narrow and they should be thin, not deeply metaphysical, so that they can get uh, assent from people who have different religions, different uh, conceptions of the overall good life. So while I do have views about that, and I'd be willing to talk about that with my family and my friends, I, it's not what I do as a political philosopher. I, I do think I can recommend a partial and you know a kind of minimal building block of the good life, and that's what the capabilities approach in my version, rather different from Amartya Sen's, ha has come to, to be. So I, I do think any decent society ought to guarantee to all its citizens a th threshold level of some fundamental entitlements, including health care. I mean, there's, uh, there's this list that I propose, which is basically like a list of fundamental human rights. But I use the term, uh, along with Sen, the term capabilities, because I want to say What's important is that people should actually be able to go out and do these things, not just have some so-called rights on paper. So that, I mean, if you want to call that a, a partial vision of the good life, okay. But the point is you can use it, not use it, whatever your conception tells you to do. Um, you found yourself, as you described at the beginning of uh, the monarchy of fear uh, in Japan when the election was being decided and uh, um, you were shocked and uh, you felt 
distant from the country home um, and were trying to make a sense of what was happening. In what way has your vision of that frustration uh, or that perplexity uh, changed in this two years of where the country was to where the country is? Well, okay, first of all, what happened to me then, and I have to say, maybe I should always be in some hotel room because it was like not having my friends to hug at this time and being in a situation where I was supposed to be cheerful and expressing happiness and gratitude for this Kyoto Prize, but all the time having this terror in my gut about the country and what was happening. That was an experience that made me change my views about a number of important things. I had written these separate books about this emotion and that emotion, anger, disgust, compassion, but I hadn't understood important causal relationships among the emotions, and in particular, just thinking about my own fear and why it was so unbalanced. Um, I thought, well, really, we're all, we all are born in fear. We live a lot of our lives in fear. And fear, because we're all mortal and we, we know that we're, we have death awaiting us, uh, then fear will surge up at times of vulnerability. And that happens in politics, too. That when we feel vulnerable, uh, fear gets the better of us a lot of the time. And it's not, not easily tethered to really important goals. So that was my project, and I got started thinking about how fear infects anger, it makes people turn to a kind of scapegoating and blame laying, it infects the emotion of disgust, making people want to stigmatize and pillory groups as animal, and I think that's a very prominent part of the last few years, the, the discussion of immigration in terms of infestation the idea that certain countries are, well, I won't even use the word, are something countries. And uh, then the discussions of women in reference to their disgusting bodily fluids. And so, so you know, disgust is, is another one that I talked about. So I guess I've seen these same things playing themselves out in increasingly uh, uh, upsetting ways. But, you know, I've also seen what I called for in the last chapter of the book, which is on hope. And, and what I said there is that hope is not just an emotion, but it's also a set of action tendencies. So having hope is something that really is important to do, because if you think you should be doing something good for the common good, then as Kant said, you, you really have an obligation to get your, work yourself into a hopeful frame of mind, because otherwise you won't do the things that promote the common good. I've seen such a tremendous outpouring of energy in politics, the midterm elections, with so many young people, so many new people, so many women entering politics. And I think the energy of women has been particularly exciting and, and gratifying to me uh, because all, all these years I've been writing about women and I've written, written also about the gay rights movement, but for a while it looked like the gay rights movement was succeeding, whereas the women's movement is stalled. I think it's still stalled, but I think there's tremendous positive energy there and I'm really looking forward to, to the next uh, 10 years. It seems that uh, uh, Donald Trump likes to generate fear. He likes to use his tweets, his, uh, his uh, press uh, communications to generate that type of emotion in the rest of us. And maybe has even become uh, more professionalized in how he does it. Well, you shouldn't forget that Trump is an actor. He is a performer. He was a very successful reality TV uh, actor. And I, I guess I'd have no idea what's in the heart of hearts of Donald Trump. And I, in a way, I don't care because I think he's a skilled performer who's, who's playing to an audience. And what's significant is that audience and their views and what is it that makes people want to, to hear these things. Now, I do think he uses the rhetoric of fear in an extremely irresponsible way. I have a part in the book where I talk about Aristotle's rhetoric and how the orator can whip up fear by making you think that danger is big and imminent and so on. And then I compare, actually, just for reasons of even-handedness, two different Republican presidents, George W. Bush after 9-11, did not demonize Muslims. He very carefully said, we're going to 
identify the criminals and we'll bring them to justice, but we will not demonize an entire religion or an entire people. And it was so important to him that he left a whole archive of such statements that he had made. So I quote a number of those. And then I quote from some speeches of Trump, where of course he is doing just what Bush avoided doing. He's demonizing Islam and Muslims and trying to create a, a frenzy of fear around the whole notion of immigration, which of course is something that is not a source of much crime in America at all. And the d statistics show that again and again. But people can easily be made to believe that there's this horde, this infestation, and it's not only people from Central America, but actually mixed in or Middle Eastern terrorists, all this stuff. You know, and it does make people afraid, but it's not only fear, but then it's the kind of fear that turns to anger. And that, I think, is the, the worrisome thing. When we're afraid, it's a uh, feeling of powerlessness. And if we can blame somebody and we can deploy aggression against that object, then, uh, of course, we feel powerful. And it's very human to do that. So if, you're, if your mother's just died in the hospital, it's very human to think, well, I'll sue the doctors, you know, to turn your fear into control and aggression. So I think Trump knows this about people. And of course, our earliest fairy tales uh, often have that structure. I mean, think about Hansel and Gretel, who are hungry children, who have working class parents who don't, can't, can't feed them, so they go into the woods to search for food. Okay, that's a real human problem that needs a structural solution. But the story right away said, oh no, that's not the problem at all. It's one witch who lives in the woods. And we take that witch and we put her into the oven and then lo and behold, the problem of hunger is solved. That's Trump in a nutshell, that he'll take a simple de deflection and say, if we can only you know, build a wall or keep out these people in the caravan, then our problems are, are solved. I want to go to the question of, or to the issue of anger in a second, but I, I want to stop just momentarily in something you said, uh, Martha, and that is that Trump is an actor. Uh, that is that he pretends uh, and he will play for the audience. Of course, we've had before Trump uh, at least one more actor, uh, Ronald Reagan. And I wonder if I can get you to develop a little further the response, uh, the reaction that we as the uh, population have to somebody whom we know might not be authentic, might not be genuine, might be pretending, an usurper, an imposter, vis-a-vis -vis someone who is more authentic, though one might suggest that politics by definition is theater. Well, look, any, <clears throat> any politician has to be an actor, I think. But I think there is a big difference between Reagan and Trump in that <clears throat> Reagan was an actor with a script. He was perfectly OK when he had some lines written by somebody else. But there was no reason to think that he had no views of his own. But Trump is like a, 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 an improv actor or a stand-up comic that he plays off of the reactions of the audience. And no, of course, the film actor can't do that by definition. So he's doing this all the time. He sees what gets the crowd going. Then he gives them more of that. If he doesn't get the reaction he wants, he pulls back. So uh, I think that's one way of seeing him. And no doubt, he probably has some views. But I think it's more important to him to get that reaction. Um, I remember when the when the Reagan era ended that we, some of us on the left, thought there's nothing worse than can come. The only, only things better. And then it, when the W. Bush era ended, we thought this is it. Finally, we're out of this. Can we in the future think that there's something that's going to be worse than Trump? It certainly could be. <laughs> because t Trump is a pragmatist and he will play to the audience, but he'll also try to figure out how to get to the next point. Uh, no, I mean, I think he's not an ideologue, really. And sure, there could be somebody much worse than Trump who would be more ideological. Martha, one of the, the maybe of the, of the many emotions, the several emotions that you deal with in your book, and, and I'm listing the principal ones, um, uh, fear and anger and disgust and envy and jealousy, anger plays a, 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 a 
pivotal, crucial role. And I, I would like to ask you, I asked you this question in the, in the, on the radio. I'd like you to tell the audience, because I found it to be so interesting, how you deal with your own anger. <laughs> well, um, now what I said in the program is, I, this is referring back to an earlier book of mine called Anger and Forgiveness, which, which is relevant to the present book, but it's, it's longer and more detailed. And I say there are actually three zones in which we experience anger. There's political anger, there's anger in intimate personal relations, but then there's this vast uh, area, which I call the middle realm, which is like anger on airplanes, anger where the computer guy doesn't fix your computer. In other words, anger in daily life interactions with mostly strangers, although I do have a bit on the, the workplace and colleagues, irritating colleagues too. Um, no, I think, well, the, the general line I take on anger is, is very much inspired by people such as Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., namely that the retributive part of anger is useless and pernicious and creates only more pain. I mean, Gandhi said, uh, an eye for an eye, makes the whole world blind. Uh, now, King, I think, very usefully said, when the people come to his movement, they bring their anger with them, and that's okay, but the anger has to be purified and channelized. And what he meant was that the protest part that expressed outrage, this should not happen again, that they should keep, and they should learn to have the courage to stand up and make that protest. But the retributive part, get rid of that and turn to the future with love and faith. So that's my general line. And, and I guess I, I don't have so much trouble doing that with the people I've ever loved because I guess I think I choose good people in the first place. I kind of know that they're good people and, and so then I reinvent some other relationship with them of friendship or whatever. Uh, and and I never, it never occurs to me to want to, you know, pay them back pain for pain. And in politics too, I, I am a very optimistic and constructive kind of a person and I really think that reason and deliberation can accomplish quite a lot. But where I get really mad is in the middle realm. I mean, today with a rude TSA screener, you know, it's just the sort of thing that, where I expect people to be courteous and rational, and of course they're not, and then I just really am not prepared for that somehow, <laughs> and I should be. But I think it's because, you know, Seneca, the, the Stoic philosopher said, you should tell yourself every day, these things are not worth getting upset about. Now, of course that's true, but therefore, because they're not important, I don't tell myself that every day. I don't bother doing spiritual exercises about my TSA anger. And, and so then, you know, it's just ridiculous. I do uh, many, many ridiculous things when I'm caught out by some rude person. <laughs> um. We are, Martha, fascinated in theater, in a art in general, by getting back at someone. Yeah. Vengeance. Um, is there, you and I have talked a little bit about it, is there a situation where you can see that, and we are looking at a, land, a political landscape that unfortunately makes this question pertinent, can you see any circumstance in which revenge is acceptable? No, no, but I want to emphasize that I think protest and saying we'll never let that happen again, that is acceptable, of course. And But then what, what's gonna make it never happen again? Not the revenge. I mean, if your child has been murdered, putting that person into the electric chair doesn't help the child come back and it doesn't help other people not kill and so on. But so we should think <coughs> about the future. That's the only thing we can change. And we should figure out, if we use punishment, how to punish in a way that looks to the future, that deters other people, that deters that person, and that, if possible, reforms and educates the work you're doing in prisons. I think that's just so important and amazing. Uh, why are we so fascinated by revenge? Is this? Do you think of this um, 
expiatory aspect in theater that we see it on stage uh, in order later on not to do it ourselves. There's a there's a teaching lesson uh, in in watching a, a, a tragedy or a, a play of our revenge that will uh, you know walk us through it so that we don't have to walk through it. Well, I think that a lot of I mean, of course, literary works are all over the map on this, but the works that I love most, not surprisingly, are the ones that show the emptiness and uselessness of revenge. Iskos's Oristaya plays a big part in the book because it starts out with the impulse to revenge, but then with the third play, when democracy is founded, they have to find a way to turn it over to the law and get rid of the impulse to revenge. And that means not just substituting legal revenge for private revenge, that's the way some people read it, but it actually means that we have to have different sentiments. We have to have sentiments of a constructive sort, goodwill, and we have to think how to live together. So that's what you know resonates with me. And in, in terms of the music that I love, I'm a huge fan of Mozart operas and the most obsessive and constantly repeated theme in all of Mozart's operas is how to substitute the spirit of love and reconciliation for the previously dominant spirit of you know, insulted honor and revenge from the abduction from the seraglio where all of a sudden the, the person who has been doing all kinds of bad things says, no, I'm gonna stop it, no revenge, and I'm just gonna let you be happy in the future. Idomeneo, which I particularly love a play where the father is told by the revenge gods, you've got to thank the gods by sacrificing the next person you see. And it turns out to be his own son. Of course, it's a reference, Mozart's way of um, undermining the Abraham Isaac story. Mozart was a lifelong Freemason and he didn't believe in traditional Christianity. And so, uh, you know, what has to happen in that play is all of a sudden a voice speaks to that father when he has his knife in the air and says, no, from now on there will be a new kingdom ruled by the young lovers and the spirit of love will take over from the spirit of revenge. And this is just again and again in, in pretty much all of Mozart's operas. The, the magic flute is, is the end of the, the train, so to speak, that in that opera it, it explicitly Freemasonry reigns, equality, liberty, brotherhood, and the queen of the night, who is this very charismatic spirit of revenge, she's got, got to get out of there. There's no, no place for her in the, the new European world. You describe yourself in a number of places, including in the book, as an amateur singer, and, and uh, you love opera, and you... So I, can you reflect briefly on, on what the singing does to you? Well, of course, first of all, it's just very joyful. Uh, just to, you know, in the morning before I go to the office to sing for about 45 minutes. It's um, just to have the breath working in the right way and so on. It just makes, sets me up for the whole day and makes me feel a, a, a great uh, sense of integration, you know, very much the way physical exercise does too, but I usually do the physical exercise, then I do the singing. Um, but What's also interesting is that my voice happens to be a type that usually gets to sing revenge stuff, uh, <laughs> dramatic soprano, and so I do use it to investigate stuff that I don't really understand myself. And so since I was writing the program note for Idomeneo, and there is this one character, Electra, who is the old spirit of revenge, not surprisingly, she's the old Greek Electra, and uh, and she has these two amazing arias, and and they're fascinating musically. But you know how to try to think of a human being expressing this obsession with revenge. So with my teacher, who by the way happens to be Justice Ginsburg's daughter-in-law, so we often mix discussion of the <laughs> law with singing and so on. Um, but you know, thinking about where is her heart. And there are places where she says, gone forever shall be love, mercy, and pity. But then you have to, in saying those words, find her love and her mercy and her pity that are still there, but she's trying to override them and get through them in order to have her revenge. And then, then what you understand is that the revenge is, it really means the extinction 
of her heart. And, and I, I think I understand a lot better what's going on with her when I actually sing it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful to, to investigate in that way. And we do a lot of theater in our law school. We put on plays, so we, we do acting too. And, and that's, I think, everyone. The other thing that theater does is it humanizes an intellectual workplace, especially in law. It's very competitive and very dry. Uh, and I find when I put on these plays, and I'm always the impresario, and I tell my colleagues, you know, You're, you would really be good as this part. Um, it really brings the community together. And, you know, when the most uh, right-wing person on our faculty played Menelaus in a production of The Trojan Women, and he was hilariously funny, and I was Hecuba, and so we all hug each other at the end, and the students came up to us and said, well, we're so surprised that the faculty have such affection and rapport. We, I, I think they wouldn't have thought that the most right-wing person and I would ever hug each other. Well, of course we would. But I think the theater promotes that kind of emotional rapport, that, which can then be the basis for a deliberative Martha, I was struck by uh, what you said, that you use your voice to tackle that which you don't know. Okay. Um, which other ways do you use to tackle that which you don't know? And how do you identify that which you don't know? Well, I'm lucky to have amazing colleagues, and, and we read each other's work a lot, and we're no holds barred about critical commentary. This book is dedicated to a particular colleague who always gives me tough comments and helps me see things I didn't see before. We've co-authored a book, which we might talk about later on. But, uh, you know, it's that kind of fearless but really knowledgeable input which I get from graduate students too, but particularly from the law school colleagues because we're together so much. We just happen to be a very close-knit community of only 38 faculty. And, you know, it's a precious gift to have that, but of course demanding the same in return. So I spend a lot of time reading my colleagues' work and giving them critical comments, and, and that's just amazing. It's why I'm so happy at Chicago. I wouldn't go any other place because people are very unselfish and they really give their own intellect to other people. Um, I have a, I have benefited enormously from the way you have led me as a reader uh, to the classics, to the Romans and the Greek uh, thinkers and philosophers. I'd love you to reflect on how you discovered them early on in your life. Uh, the the plays that they uh, have in you, uh, not in teaching, but in general, what you find in them in terms of wisdom at times of fear, of anger, or frustration. Uh, why do the classics matter? Well, I mean, I guess the first thing is it's just it happenstance uh, of my education that I came up with those classics rather than the Sanskrit classics and so so you know I want to say that I always didn't I, I make my colleagues very bored because I say you should never say the word ancient philosophy you should always say ancient Greek and Roman philosophy you should never say classics you should say the Greek and Roman classics and I do think that's very important I love India I spend a lot of time in India I study India but I don't know the language is, and, and so I could never really write about the Mahabharata, but I can know that that's something that other people can, you know, put in the same place that I put Aeschylus and, and so on for, for other major traditions of thought and, and literature. So I came upon these because that's what we were supposed to read. And then what I loved about the tragedies was their emotional depth. And in high school already, I was acting parts because I really did a lot of theater in high school. I then left college. I left Wellesley after studying Greek. So I started to learn Greek in, in college. But I left Wellesley to take a job acting in a professional repertory theater company where Judith Anderson was playing Clytemnestra in the Oresteia and Ruby D, one of the most admirable and wonderful of people that I've ever met in my life. She was playing Cassandra. So I was in the chorus. The chorus was choreographed by one of the leading dancers of the Martha Graham company. So I learned so much dance. I really was in awe of those dancers who really had studied this for many years. But, you know, I loved the play, and we did the Oresteia as a three-act play, 
And I think I came to just know every word of that. We did it in English, but I had also read it in Greek, and I went back and read it in Greek. So I guess they're just vehicles for the exploration of the deepest human emotions. Another one that I love, that I've repeatedly acted in, once in Greek and re more recently in English, is Euripides' The Trojan Women. And we, so recently, what we did was a conference on war in law and literature. And I thought, OK, the play we're going to put on is The Trojan Women, because it's about all the horrible things that can happen in the aftermath of a war, most of them to women, because they're the ones who are left behind. So there is rape. There is de desolation, losing all your children and grandchildren. There is the mother who has her young child snatched from her to be put to death. And then, of course, there's Helen of Troy, who's able to get away with everything because she's so seductive. And so there's that injustice in, in the middle of it. Uh, so we put this on, and we had an amazing cast of, of, of law professors. But some of them, you know, there's Andromache was a woman who, who probably would have been a professional actress, but for the fact that she's Korean-American. And she thought in her young days, after getting an acting scholarship, a Korean woman cannot really do well in the on the stage because I don't see anyone up there who looks like me. So here she is teaching administrative law and playing the part of Andromache. And wow, she's an amazing actress. So, so I just find that plays like that uh, and there are so many. I mean, Sophocles' Electra was performed professionally at our court theater right after the election of 2016 by an African-American director, Surette Scott. And in an amazing performance, the actress Kate Fry, who played Electra, is one of our great American actresses. So, you know, just plumbing the depths of human emotion. It's not only the Greeks that do this, but boy, it seems so valuable to go back to them again and again. We were talking uh, in the car, not on, in front, not with a microphone, uh, Martha, about uh, uh, Cicero and uh, the lessons on how to live life, and thus my first question of what's a good life. But you have written on this other part of Cicero that I was that we were talking about, and that is how to age well. Um, this is the book that you wrote with your colleague. Uh, how does one age well? Well, so the the idea of the book that Saul Levmore and I put together, it's a, it's paired essays, so it's not a thorough uh, co-authorship, but we respond to each other in the different essays. The idea was everyone is writing about pain and about death, but actually aging is a very long period of active living might begin in your 60s or something, and it might go up. Who knows how long it's going to go? And people are not thinking about that because they don't want to face it. But there's a lot of topics. What to do about your money? Do you want to distribute equally to your children? Our, our first two chapters are both our essays about King Lear. So we begin with that, that aging problem. Uh, but Cicero, I wanted, of course, to plumb the philosophical tradition. My colleague is an economist. Um, and there are really only two works in Western philosophy about aging, and one is Cicero's on a, um, well, it's translated on old age, but I'd rather say on aging, De Senectute. And um, that was written in 45 BCE. While Cicero was forced into retirement from politics because he was at odds with the people that were in power, Mark Antony in particular. And so he was very sympathetic, ultimately, with the tyrannicides who, who killed Julius Caesar right after that. But anyway, at this time, he was in retirement, and he was despairing about the future of the Republic. So he writes to his friend Atticus, saying, well, he wrote two little works. One was about friendship. But he says, Atticus, you and I are not really old yet. And that's quite interesting, because they were 65 and 62. And in those days, you would think that would be quite old. But no, Rome was a very healthy place. And we have to remember that there was good diet, no tobacco, good clean air. There's no sign of anything like Alzheimer's disease. And I, I really do believe that that has an environmental cause. But, but anyway, he says, let's start looking ahead and thinking about aging. And then he invents a little dialogue where the really old person is 84. And then he has that person visited by some younger people who say, well, what is old age like? We want to know, because you seem to be doing pretty well. And 
Well, Cato, the, the character, says, well, there are a lot of prejudices about aging. You lose your mind, you lose your body, you have no pleasure, and you're dominated by paralyzing fear of death. So those four prejudices then form the argument of the work. And he, he says, well, as far as the mind goes, you've got to you know, use it or lose it. You have to keep doing stuff. You have to be active. He said, I write every day, and I'm learning new languages. All the things that people now say that you should do. So he was uh, practicing his Greek body. Well, he says, you're probably not going to be able to charge up the mountainside on a horse, which, by the way, Cicero did at the age of 60. But, but so he put that in deliberately. But Cato says, well, I do a lot of, of gardening. He calls it farming, but I think we might think in terms of gardening. And then he goes on and on. And there's a certain amount of gentle comedy about the fact that Cato talks a little bit too much. And he, he, these long digressions about the marvelous properties of manure in gardening and so so um, you know he's have, Cicero's having some fun with the defects of aging but really it acquits itself pretty well and as far as pleasure goes he says well probably good not to drink too much because most people have too much of that drinking and it's, it's good to to be forced to be moderate by your constitution so um, so anyway it's uh, a delightful work it is fun and he the young people enjoy his company he enjoys theirs and it's a, a really interesting work I think it's less interesting by itself than when we combine it with Cicero's letters to his actual friend which show the great importance of friendship in aging but anyway it's just so so rich and it's much better the other work at the other end of history is Simone de Beauvoir's La Vieillesse, which I think is translated as The Coming of Age. I find that book uh, depressing and not very well put together. And it's just like she doesn't like not being found beautiful anymore. So she's going to say that old age is definitely the necessary experience for everyone is that you get depressed and you retire from society, and you have nothing to contribute anymore. But I think you know she's projected her own personal uh, depression onto the world, and that's uh, the, well, that might be biographically interesting, but not philosophically. <laughs> <laughs> Martha, um, one of the you were telling me that one of the purposes that you are hoping to put a, at least part of the price that you got recently is to generate, to sponsor and generate dialogue between different factions, uh, if I'm getting it right, yeah. uh, within the university where you are, right. uh, that you find they don't talk to one another. I want, uh, you also were talking to me about uh, your family, which is representative of many families in the United States, where there are the people on the right and the people on the left, or the Republicans and Democrats, or the Trumpians and the, and the the rest, uh, and um, that uh, sometimes the dialogue can be uh, uncomfortable, and there's a way to either engage. Um, I, I, you know, it's it's very much what we've been trying to do here with the idea of point counterpoint. Um, how do we bring back that dialogue in a genuine and influential and lasting way uh, that doesn't? create a caricature of the other at a time when the media and the politicians, particularly Trump, emphasize how we are divided into two sides and one is fake and the other one is not, and so on. Well, I mean, I think any good solution to this has to be contextual and what you are doing here is different from what I would do in a much bigger university. Um, and I think what you're doing with this series is, is wonderful. And uh, so congratulations to you. Now, what we found in the law school, I mean, this gift of mine was made specifically to the law school just because the college has its own programs and those are already underway. But we found that increasingly, and we do get a lot of very conservative students because religious conservatives think that our law school, among the top five is the one where they would not be marginalized the way they would be at Harvard and Yale. But then they form their own little clique. And they wouldn't, for example, sign up for a whole course with me 
because they would think, oh, left-wing professor, and that used not to happen. And I really want to get them into a class. And so one thing I, I actually do is to co-teach with a, a, a very conservative colleague named Will Bode, who's a brilliant constitutional scholar, and he's, he's more of a libertarian than a true conservative. But anyway, we taught this wonderful class together where both groups of students did come, and it was called Public Morality and Legal Conservatism. Uh, so I really love that co-teaching. But the new program is, and it was the idea of the deputy dean, I guess, of the time, that people who don't want to take a whole class could still sign up for a 90-minute lunchtime event where they will know that there will be about 15 people talking about a controversial uh, topic with two professors. And we've tried various different combinations. I mean, sometimes the people don't really disagree. They represent different perspectives. So I did one on sexual violence with a much younger male colleague and and that was really really interesting and, and and you know having different perspectives on that topic but most recently I did one with Will Bode again on the bakery cases and on the whole issue of uh, whether you have an opt out from the uh, non-discrimination laws for religion and uh, there what was so interesting we did give them some readings beforehand we don't always do that was that even though going in, and they had written their views, so we knew. People had very different views. Yeah, at the end of 90 minutes, they not only spoke civilly and respectfully, but they actually worked toward, a, I would say, a consensus, which basically was that, well, if, if there is non-discrimination legislation and you're a public accommodation, you don't get out of it, but if it's a small family-run thing that doesn't come under the legal definition of public accommodation, then perhaps you, you would. But anyway, that was just so interesting to see. And it was very Chicago to think that market-based solutions of that sort could actually uh, help help us, but I think uh, it's, uh, it was actually very, very good. So my gift was to you know underwrite and perpetuate that program and I, I, I think it's a, a great program and you know the more we do it the, the better it is for all of us because it's so hard when people vote with their feet and they'll think this is a conservative class this is a liberal class so this lunch time thing because it only requires 90 minutes is was our way of overcoming that that obstacle well I love and, and salute you n not only for for what you're doing right now, but because it is very clear from everything you've said today that it's in the dialogue where one finds uh, so much, uh, so much of one's uh, knowledge and what is unknown uh, and what the, the other person is and, and how we are vis-a-vis -vis others. I want to um, say that I have one more question for Martha and after this I we invite people to come here on the left is a microphone uh, to ask her any question connected with the book or with her work. Um, uh, I want to ask you, Martha, if we, I want, I want to focus on, on democracy, on the moment we are in, uh, in the democratic system. Uh, one argument would be that uh, democracy, and we've, uh, I've, I've asked the same question to the uh, four previous guests, that uh, uh, Trump represents probably one of the most a, a dramatic tests to our democracy and that the democracy is a fragile a, and, a, and, and needs to be protected. Um, the other side talks equally about protection but thinks that actually Trump is proof that we are at a moment where our institutions are very strong because he, the way he's testing them. Uh, where are we with democracy in your view, not only in the United States, but uh, in the world at large? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing to say is that given my understanding of the power of fear in human life, democracy is always a fragile achievement, just as love and reciprocity in personal relations are a fragile achievement. They always need to be worked on. They always need to be protected from various uh, assaults from 
fear, self-interest, and, and so on. So, uh, you know, it's not a, we never get to a steady state. We always have to work, and I think that's true in, in life as, as in political life. I think, you know, there is a lot of good news. I was just writing the preface for the German translation of this book and thinking about differences between the U.S. and Europe. I'm actually much more fearful for the future of Europe for several reasons. I think federalism is huge. The United States is a very large country. It's just not possible for any wave of anything to sweep over the whole country. And, uh, you know, if we don't like what's going on in Washington, we can always turn to our state and to our city and, and find a lot to hope for there. And, of course, we do. And I, I'm a proud Chicagoan, and I'm really very invested in my city and in my state and the midterm elections. I was working for a sort of insurgent Democrat who defeated one of the longtime Republican incumbents. It's just delightful at the local level to see what you can do. So despair is headed off, I think, by federalism. And um, Europe doesn't have, it has limited federalism in Germany, but, but it's all much more homogeneous and the, the national is a much bigger deal. And I think that does mean that currents of irrationality and anti-immigrant fear and so on can sweep over the whole place much more. I mean, we're a sanctuary city in Chicago and we're not going to stop being it just because Jeff Sessions tells us that we shouldn't. And when he wrote this uh, memo about why we, sh we shouldn't have a consent decree with the the, the police between the, uh, well, so we have this long process about police and criminal justice. And finally, a consent decree was worked out to talk about the behavior of police officers and what they could and couldn't do. Jeff Sefton says, oh, we shouldn't have a consent decree. But the mayor just laughed and said, well, he has no standing. It's like an amicus brief in a Supreme Court case. Okay, so he's had his say and now we'll do what we're gonna do. And that's basically the, the American tradition. And I think it, it can be, of course, very bad as prior to the Civil War, states' rights were the bulwark for, for slavery. But still, in a time of fear, I think uh, federalism is very important. Then, divided sovereignty between the courts and the, um, the, the legislature, the legislature and the executive. Now there, I have some fear because of the huge number of appellate judicial appointments that Trump has been filling at a great pace. And I, I actually blame Obama because he let that slip. He, the minute there was a whiff of opposition, he would drop some nomination because it wasn't the thing that he cared about. He wanted to focus on health care, and there's case after case where he let a very good nominee go, go down because he just didn't fight for it. So that left all these vacancies, and then Trump is just charging ahead. Um, I also think it was rash of the Democrats to agree to the, the majority vote in the Senate for judicial appointments. But anyway, that's so, uh, you know, we're all clinging to the hope that the Supreme Court doesn't get any more unbalanced than it is now. So I, I do think that that kind of um, divided sovereignty is very, very important for the country that the life term of judges, while it's irritating to some people, it is extremely good because it means they're not hostage to the whim of the moment. So we just have to, to hope that the older ones live long and, 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 <laughs> uh, and are, are very, very healthy. Yeah, so I, you know, I think in general though, our institutions are in better shape than the European institutions. For example, environmental policy, if the federal side is dragging, states can do a huge amount. California is now doing a lot on both animal rights and environment. My daughter, who's an animal rights lawyer who works in Denver, goes out to Sacramento to testify for some bill on animal protection because that's where the action is, you know. So, and of course, what California does influences what food can be sold elsewhere because if you can't market the egg in California, you're not going to want to produce that, that kind of an egg and, and so on. Uh, questions? Anybody who wants to come uh, uh, front here and ask, uh, this is the right moment.
uh, we can bring we can bring the microphone if there's please sure yeah please do uh, yeah who, just raise your hand and we'll make sure to please go ahead hi I'm a student at Smith so I'm very excited hi. to see you in March <laughs> Um, in your final chapter on hope and monarchy of fear, you mentioned two philosophers who are working in the public sphere, having conversations in a similar vein to these lunch talks that you're having with people of opposing views. You mentioned David Novak and John Corvino. Yeah. And one, one trait you mentioned in both of them is good humor. And I'm wondering how you think of humor functioning in our discourse, specifically political discourse. Oh, that's a wonderful question. Yes, let me tell the others who these are. So... Um, David Novak, I've been writing about gay rights for a long time, and often when people try to get a group together, to commentators on what I write about same-sex marriage, they'll pick people who agree with me. But I, I also want somebody who disagrees with me. But there are people who disagree with me who are, I would say, not in good faith. They're not arguing you know, respectfully and civilly and so on. So David Novak is a professor of religion, a very distinguished scholar of Judaism at the University of Toronto, who is very conservative on this issue and who is also a very respectful, very decent arguer. And I have great um, value, uh, you know, I attach great value to that. So I always get him invited and, and so forth because it's so good to have a real argument on this issue and not just have people running through moves that they think uh, they ought to, to go through. Now, I don't agree with him. I'm never persuaded by him and I don't think he's persuaded by me. But on the other hand, we, we do learn. We learn from each other. So then Corvino is a, an excellent philosopher at Wayne State in Detroit who write, who's written a lot about gay rights. He, he wrote a book called What is Wrong with Homosexuality where he talks about religious objections to homosexuality. But he also went around the country with an evangelical pastor who was somebody that he could again, have that kind of rapport with, who was open and civil and so on, and with great good humor and good uh, good faith, they, they debate these issues. Now, I think that's extremely valuable, but the humor is important because I think um, no one gets on their high horse, no one is, um, you know, there's a sense that, well, if I can tell a funny story about myself, then that helps to leaven the whole issue. So people, especially I think when they think of same-sex marriage, people kind of cl close up and they think, oh, there might be some sort of strange thing over there. But when John can tell, you know, funny stories about himself and his husband and the, the, what, the way they divide the housework or whatever, it just uh, leavens the whole situation and makes it seem fully human. And I really, really value that. I think in politics, that's always one of my favorite Democratic politicians is John Hickenlooper, the governor of Colorado. And his autobiography is entitled The Opposite of Woe, My Life in Beer and Politics. Now, he is a craft beer brewer. That's how he made his money. So that's where the beer comes from. But you can see from that title that he's a joyful person who, full of humor, including humor, directed at himself. And I think we really need such a person. Yes. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, you mentioned thinking about the future and what we can improve as a, spe like as a species, as a culture. Um, you mentioned, for example, uh, issues of alienation for immigrants and uh, similar cultural issues um, cur like cur as current ones. And I wanted to think, or I wanted to ask you, what do you think about the current meat industry and where would our culture move uh, towards that, not just from an environmental perspective, but from a more ethical perspective? Well, I have very strong views on this, and actually my current book in progress is a book about animal rights, and it uses the capabilities approach to craft a new approach to animal rights. Um, so you will, you'll see uh, what I think at, at greater length then. But I think it's very, very difficult to make headway on this in America because of the enormous, and I would say strangling power of the meat industry. It is so powerful that anyone who wants confirmation to a cabinet position, if it's anything connected to regulation, they have to have the support of the American Farm Institute, which is the meat industry. So my friend Cass Sunstein, when he was up for confirmation to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, he had written some stuff saying hunting should be banned. He had to retract. I, I, 
think he shouldn't have done it, but anyway, he did. But he needed the vote of the American Farm Institute. And you know how presidential primaries begin in Iowa. And if the person doesn't go and hold a pork sausage prominently and chomp into it, which is one of the most grossly cruel parts of the meat industry. I mean, the, the gestation crates are absolutely appalling. So I think, you know, what we can do is just work on what we can work on. And, and, and I, I guess what I think is that my own approach, uh, based on the capabilities, provides a kind of notional, ideal constitution for animals. And then, instead of just having a constitutional convention, because that's impossible, we just work each of us in our own way on whatever part of it we can possibly, possibly uh, get progress on. And like Peter Singer, I don't think it makes sense to let the best be the enemy of the good, so that if we can produce something that's better, then I think, I think there are vegans who think you should not compromise, humane killing is equally bad and so on. But I actually think if we can move toward more um, decently raised animals who have a decent life and then are humanely killed, that is progress. So I'm a meliorist in that sense and that puts me at odds with some people in the animal rights movement. But I, I do feel it's one of the, the worst um, moral evils of our time and, and I'm so glad to see that people are beginning to talk about it in philosophy. Christine Korsgaard, another wonderful, she's a wonderful philosopher at Harvard, has published a, a new book called Fellow Creatures, which is a terrific book about animals, and other people are working on this too. So I think it's a, you know, the things are, are changing intellectually, and let's hope that really means something. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for your uh, very insightful talk. Um, so my question has to do with Donald Trump. You very eloquently described him as an actor and as an improv comedian and as someone who demonizes practically swaths of the human species. Um, we, you know, in our discourse we do, we try so hard to understand why Donald Trump and his, antic, and his antics are effective and we succeed, as you just did. Um, but, you know, one reason why an actor is thrilling and one reason why an improv comedian is funny is that the audience thinks he's in thrilling or he's right. funny. And I was wondering, you know, it, it seems obvious that we just shouldn't be entertained by racist, misogynist, xenophobic humans, racist, xenophobic, misogynist views. Why is it the case that, you know, in many of our discourses, we, we almost exonerate our own shortcomings as the audience? Shouldn't we need to change ourselves on this issue? Yeah, this is a great question. I think, you know, all, all the, the right-wing assaults on political correctness, on campuses, and so on, what they have to look back to is the time when I entered the university where you could, any kind of so-called humor about women's bodies, about women's minds, and so on, would pass for academic discourse, and that was perfectly okay. When I was the first woman to win the Society of Fellows Junior Fellowship at Harvard, I got a note from a prominent classicist saying, whoa, what word can we use to call you? Certainly the word fellow s is too awkward, so maybe the Greek language could solve the problem. And since the masculine word for fellow is hetairos, we could call you a hetaira. Now, the joke is that hetaira in Greek is not just the feminine of fellow, it means a courtesan, a prostitute. And so that was his very sophisticated joke. And, and he thought that I should just say, rah, 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 you have a great joke there. So that, that you know, and it was insulting and it made us, of course, feel that we were just bodies to be used and we didn't belong there. So then the question is, um, what do we do about that? And now I think it is very important that there are norms of civil discourse that make racist remarks, sexist remarks, homophobic remarks, um, inappropriate in the classroom. On the other hand, I think that there are times when that's bled over into not wanting a point of view expressed, which might be unpopular or challenging. So, you know, what I would say is in my feminist philosophy class, I would quite like 
to have someone. I'd never get such students because they don't take the class. But, you know, really challenge what feminists are saying and saying we, you know, we need to, in the class I taught with Will Bode, people did say, well, we shouldn't have same-sex marriage because everyone, if they set their mind to it, they can form a traditional marriage. Traditional marriage is the pillar of society and we should prop up traditional marriage. So, you know, people should be able to express that if they express it with respect and civility. And I don't think that such a position need intrinsically be um, deemed disrespectful. Now, it, there's a fine line though, right? I mean, when is a position so negating the being of somebody who's in the same room that it becomes intrinsically uh, disrespectful? And I think we just have to talk about that and sort that out. But I, I, I would think that we shouldn't go so far as to say that positions that you know, assail, let's say, the equality of women in the military or whatever it might be, would be completely off limits and undiscussable because otherwise we're just never going to get together to solve these problems. But, but certainly not with humor and taunting in the way that used to happen. That's the bad use of humor, so yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Professor Nusba, thank you for coming. Uh, my question, so I'm convinced by your argument that disgust corrupts moral and legal reasoning. But my question is, when wanting to change public policy, how easy is it to change people's opinions, people's disgust, people's feelings through moral and legal reasoning? And my example would be the death penalty. How easy is it to change people's minds on the death penalty when you're arguing that this the serial killer who you are disgusted by deserves to live? And is that moral argument the best argument in each well, there are people who think that even though we don't want to use disgust to subordinate groups of people like African Americans and women and gays and lesbians, we should still use disgust toward the people that we don't like, like the people who are in favor of the death penalty. And there's a kind of moralized disgust. Now, that position is, is certainly, it's been defended by some very good people. I am against it for several reasons. I think that it veers over quickly into kind of the idea that those people are contaminating us by their sheer presence and we want to shrink from them. So the, the, the stickiness of disgust is still in it, even though it is moralized, but also because the reflex, the action reflex of disgust is to distance yourself from the object that disgusts you. And that's not a constructive reflex. So if you find somebody's position abhorrent, you should engage and protest and go toward it the way King wanted his followers to engage in direct action, which means using your own body at risk to make the point. So I think disgust doesn't lead toward direct action. It leads toward running away. So for that reason, I, I don't want to use it. But so how easy is it to change is the real question you're asking. Um, not easy because a lot of these things are learned in childhood and they're deeply habitual. But I think we've first thing to say is, once we realize the nature of cognition and the way it works in emotion, we see that even an emotion that looks very bodily, like disgust, is not hardwired. It is something that's culturally learned. People didn't have disgust for African Americans if they weren't reared to have that. And so then that means we have great liberty to change, do things differently, at least in the next generation. Now, also, people can learn to not express what is unacceptable in themselves. And I know we, we do think we should tell everything about ourselves these days, but it's actually quite good if somebody finds themselves harboring racist feelings. My father was born in Macon, Georgia. He was a racist till his death, but because he was in Philadelphia, he could not say the things that he could say in Macon, and that was good. He, he kind of, he let me hear that, but uh, he didn't let his law partners hear that. And so I think inhibition uh, is a very, very good thing, and knowing that you can't express everything that uh, happens to occur to you. Most of us, according to the studies of implicit bias, have at some level racial bias, and that's a really hard lesson that the psychologists have taught us. But, but of course, we've shoved it down so far in our personalities, disapproving of it, that we don't even admit it to ourselves. And that is, you know, it's not 
bad. It, it, it's bad if we let it influence our actions without understanding how it's doing that. But it's still not bad to disown a part of you that you don't like. And then I think we will ra raise people who just don't behave the same way in the next generation. And uh, look, on, on gays and lesbians, it's happened already. People under the age of 35 have totally different views on same-sex marriage, no matter whether they're Republicans or Democrats. And that's just because they are raised with kids in their school and in their own family who are out and they see these are not monsters. These are the people that we love and that we like and so on. And, and so the whole issue has become very quickly quite different. So I think, you know, that's such an interesting one. Why has it become different so quickly where relations between women and men have not become different so quickly? I think it's because if you have a same-sex couple next door, they don't ask you to change. They just ask you to go about your business and not bother them. And so, you know, same-sex marriage and in general gay and lesbian equality does not require straight people to change in any profound respect, whereas the equality of men and women really requires men, all of us, to, to change because marriage has never been on a basis of equality and reciprocity and no one really even knows yet what that is. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts were on, um, you know, the, a discourse that some cultural commentators have had about um, Trump rallies and the almost proto-religious um, quality of them, you know, observing um, Trump supporters and their almost evangelical devotion, rallying around narratives that Trump constructs, um, you know, like chapter and verse, uh, right, right, right. You, you know, the witch hunt, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, all that. and. You know, all of this occurring under the backdrop of the increasingly secular nature of society, um, the pulling away from churches, religious participation, um, these collective, you know, religious, traditional, um, you know, values, uh, an increasingly diverse um, set of ideologies, um, philosophies, things like that. And and if and if there is something to be said about that, then um, when we're thinking about um, a way, a way out, you know, a way to heal the divide in our country. Does that involve, you know, re, you know, returning to some some cum communal humanistic values, or you know, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I think it's different in Europe, where really it has become almost totally secular. But I don't think America has. Americans are religious in individual ways and at the time of the founding only 17 percent of americans belong to any recognized church so church attendance is not a good measure of people's hunger for spiritual values buddhism is very rising in popularity for example uh, and lots of spiritual practices of various kinds but i also think that in many cities particularly religion is a tremendous source of hope and creativity, I and mean, I write in the book a bit about the black churches in Chicago, I think it's absolutely indispensable that where there was despair, there is now some hope if people participate in the various, I mean, not just religious in the narrow sense, but communal projects that the black churches put on, all kinds of protests and all kinds of philanthropic projects. So yeah, I, I do think that the religious groups will continue to be very, very important. And uh, so, and I don't think they have lost as importance as much as some people think. But where else can people come together? Well, then, of course, I talk about various other things, such as the arts, I do feel, are very important sources of humanistic coming together. In my city, the Chicago Children's Choir, where 80% of the kids who sing in it are below the poverty line, they're like, 5,000 kids who are singing all over Chicago. For races to come to know each other, given de facto housing segregation, the choir and, and other arts projects are tremendously important. And it's important for adults, too, to either participate or even just watch a performance, musical, theatrical, and so on. So I think that's very, very important. But I also, I mean, so back to your interest in traditional humanistic values, 
one of my most important things is the liberal arts education that you're getting here. Because I think it's unique in the world. I mean, Europe doesn't have that. Asia doesn't have that except in South Korea. So here we are with an education that prepares you partly, maybe for a job, but largely for citizenship in the whole of life. And that humanistic sense that by reading and thinking philosophically, we learn skills of listening and arguing, that's enormously politically valuable. When we read literary works or other works of art, training the imagination, again, that's enormously politically valuable. So I think to strengthen these campuses and just try to keep them from being barraged by the assault of, of, of careerism and professionalism, I think we can do that. But I think it's very important to keep sounding that note because it's something that is very, very fragile. And if we don't keep working for it and we don't see its function, then it, it might well be undermined. Now, of course, that's only a part of people's life, but it's a very important part where you kind of get out from under the domination of your parents and you are able to, to forge a life for yourself. And I do think we need to reinforce that by a much greater investment in lifelong learning, adult education programs sponsored by the colleges and universities for their graduates as adults and so on. So it has to be a lifelong process too, but at least it can start here. And I think that those are, if you want to call them traditional humanistic values, but I think they, they, they transcend the word humanistic since I, I'm a little skeptical of that word for the reasons given by my answer to the question about the meat industry. I think their values of um, humane democracy, which can, can think well about the environment and, and all the other problems that face us. Martha, I want to uh, bring you back to conclude this. I want to bring you back to the first chapter of your book and to the first question that I ask you. Uh, at the very beginning, you talk about being in, in Japan and the fear that you felt. Uh, and the title of your book is The Monarchy of Fear. Uh, but I wonder, you know, every book has its double. Every book uh, has the book with with everything that was left out, or the reverse, the 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 doppelganger, um, and I see that there can be people that, with the election, thought this should be the monarchy of joy. Uh, Trump won, and this is a moment of exhilaration. Uh, in what way is fear? all across the board, uh, represented by those that are on both sides. Well, look, I mean, the fact that I had fear of Trump, was that was just one kind of fear. But much more uh, at the heart of the book is the fear that brought that moment into being. Because I think, in general, when people feel helpless, they want to throw themselves into the arms of, a, of an absolute monarch. That's what monarchy is all about. That's what the title is about. And, and so what I was looking at is the phenomenon that people have this immense and almost unqualified trust in someone who in many respects is unlikely and un, not, not uh, competent because he symbolizes comfort and care and he's going to take care of you, build a wall, keep us safe. The, the whole rhetoric of the wall is a rhetoric of fear, but it makes people feel very, very good. And the other aspect of monarchy is that when people are afraid, what do they want to do? They want to, they want to behave monarchically themselves, make other people do what they want them to do. What's the baby's first reflex when it's afraid uh, is to cry and yell and make other people get them the things they can't get for themselves. So that's a part of it. Well, you, you, just listening to you give us, us hope. It's been extraordinary. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you very, very much. I love this. Thank you.